Uh, today's lecture is kind of uh, two separate topics. Uh, I want to tell you in the first half about non-determinism, and in the second half we'll start talking about uh, reductions. So as so I was mentioning, non-determinism is a topic, I wasn't even sure if I was going to discuss it, because you know, we already defined NP, uh, which is in terms of polynomial time verifiers, and that's a very satisfying definition, which I like. Um, I guess maybe it was not historically uh, the first definition of NP, and originally it was defined in terms of this concept called non-determinism, and I don't know, it's not very important to know about it, but you know, it's, it's actually right there in the name, that's what the N in NP stands for, and it's you know, somewhat important, so I decided I would tell you some stuff about non-determinism. You may have actually seen it before in the context, depending on what you did in 251, of uh, DFAs. There's a version of non-deterministic DFAs, and uh, you can also add this concept of non-determinism to Turing machines or to any old algorithm. So non-determinism is this kind of uh, feature you can add to your model of computation to make it potentially um, more powerful in terms of efficiency. Uh, I want to emphasize that like, it's not a realistic feature. It's not considered like a reasonable model of computation. So like, once you add non-determinism, it can increase the set of languages you can decide in polynomial time. Um, so why do we do it if it's not realistic? Uh, well, for analysis purposes. So somehow you know, it, it, it helps us reason about regular computation to consider this magical non-determinism feature. So uh, I'm going to describe it to you in the context of pseudocode. Um, or just like regular algorithms descriptions. Uh, probably in the homework, the next homework, I'll have you think about like how you would literally put it into Turing machines. But it's not very complicated, so I'll just describe it at a higher level today. So basically, you can think of um, <coughs> you know, a pseudocode with non-determinism. Or just you know, algorithms with non-determinism. You know, the easiest way to describe it is like you can just add to your like allowed instructions some kind of magical instruction called go to both. You know, most programming languages they still have like a go to instruction if you really want that just transfers control to a different line. You know, in Turing machines it's like there's a go to after every single line. That's the part where you transition to a new state. Uh, so you just you know add this instruction, magical instruction called go to both where um, you just put two different like, you know, labels or line numbers at the end of it. Now, how does it, I mean, what, what does that mean? Well, you could think of it kind of like a, like a parallel fork, you know? I mean, you just imagine that the, you know, when it says go to line six and also go to line seven, or uh, you just imagine maybe that there's you know, parallel processes that start doing both of these things. And those processes themselves, if they hit like another go-to both instruction, will in themselves like fork into two copies, and so forth and so on. And um, let me emphasize that this is non-realistic. I mean, it's realistic to have like some parallel forks. I mean, you can simulate that with no big deal. But um, you know, in non-determinism, you can just go crazy and do it as many times as you want, which means if you have 100 go-to both instructions, then suddenly you have 2 to the power of 100 uh, parallel processes, which is, you know, physically impossible. There's not that many atoms in the universe. Um, so, as I said, it's not realistic, but it's used for analysis purposes. Um, so, as I said, even if, you know, you have a polynomial time algorithm, it can execute this instruction polynomially many times and therefore get, like, exponentially many processes. And then, uh, well, what happens at the end? So, I mean, at the end, maybe you have exponentially many processes going, and they all come to the end, and they all like locally either accept or reject. So we have to decide like how to like join all the answers together. And this is another aspect of the definition. I'm sort of giving you a slightly informal definition here. Um, you know, we say a non-deterministic algorithm. You know, overall, except if, uh, and here we have a choice about what you know we want to write here, but this is the definition. If and only if, at least one, you know, branch accepts, 
OK, so in other words, it rejects overall if and only if all branches reject. OK, so you have all these potentially uh, many processes or branches, and they all end on either accept or reject. And if at least one of them, you can imagine that like at the end they all get together and at least one of them accepts, then overall the algorithm or the machine says, I accept x. And if all of them reject, then it says, I reject x. Okay, so uh, that's just, um, didn't have to be this way, but that's the definition for non-determinism. And we also have to talk about what does running time mean? You know, we're defining some magical new version of Turing machines or algorithms. We have to re revisit all these basic concepts. And again, you could potentially maybe define this different ways, but the running time is defined to be like the max running time over all branches. OK, so if you want to say that this non-deterministic algorithm runs in n squared steps, whatever that means, then it must be that like no matter which path it follows on this like go to both, like every no matter what happens on every branch, it should take at most n squared steps. Okay. Um, so as I said, you know, why do you why do we define this bizarro um, version of Turing machines or algorithms? Well, as you'll see, it's it's useful for reasoning about. Uh, I don't know, concepts we want to reason about, namely NP. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. If one branch moves, that means the Oh, yeah. I didn't talk about, that's a good point. I should have talked about, uh, talked about that. Um, really, before we define running time, we should even decide, define, like, what is a decider. So, yeah, actually, I should add that. I mean, a non-deterministic algorithm is a decider if all branches always halt. OK, so if even one branch gets it into an infinite loop, then like the whole thing counts as looping. Like it does not decide any language. OK, so if you, in a positive sense, if you want to design, hypothetically, a non-deterministic algorithm that solves a problem, in you know, n squared time, then every single branch has to halt in at most n squared time. But you have this bizarro property that like, you can spawn all these branches. And in order to accept, it's enough that at least one branch accepts. <clears throat> OK, so as an example of this, um, I'll show you that SAT Oh, the formula set is solvable or decidable, I should say, uh, in poly time with a non deterministic algorithm. All right, so uh, here it is. I pre-prepared it. So let's take a look. Uh, this is the description of a non-deterministic algorithm written in pseudocode. Um, and it's supposed to be solving SAT. So remember SAT is you get some input formula you know, with ands and ors and nots and stuff, implies if you want, with some n variables. And you're trying to decide, does there exist an assignment to the n variables that satisfies the formula. And somehow that, that question, like, does there exist an assignment that does such and such, is like very compatible with this part of the definition, like, if at least one branch accepts. So like, kind of, they're tailor-made for each other. So let's take a look at this algorithm. So first step, I just, I'm going to cook up an array x with length n, and that's going to be like my um, potential satisfying assignment, or my potential solution that I'm going to check. OK, and it's a bit hard to tell here because I wrote a loop with, instead of with like a for loop, I wrote it with go to's. <laughs> but uh, this piece here, from here down to here, is like a basic loop. It's, it's basically like it's roughly doing for i equals 1 to n. But, uh, you know, 
It's got a, like a top label here, and we're going to go to the top at the bottom. So what does it do? OK, it increments i. And if it get, i gets bigger than n, then it goes to the n. This last line with label check is like the end. So we'll come back to that in a second. But basically, you know, it's incrementing i, and i greater than n go to the end. That's just like doing a for loop written with go-tos. OK, so the first line of the, the for loop is like the magical go-to both instruction that uh, we're using here. And so you put like two labels here. You try to go to both this location and this location. So you can think of that as like a fork, if you like. And the two locations are called write 0 and write 1. Uh, so what do you do in write 0? You just put a 0 into the ith, you know, like false, into the ith uh, entry of x. And then you just go back to the top. And similarly, in write 1, you put a 1 into the ith entry of x. And you go back to the top. Okay, and then you do that for i equals 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So let me just make some observations over here. This thing overall will you know, spawn exactly 2 to the n branches. Because there's nothing too tricky about it. It does like this loop n times, and each time it does like one go to both, which has two forks, and each of you know, the, them continues in the loop. And in fact, in some sense, like each branch, the whole point of it, each branch fills this array x with, you know, a different string, a binary string. OK, so that's the whole point of this loop, plus the go to both, is to just basically fill up an array, or if it were on a Turing machine, like write down on the tape a string of like n bits. And somehow the two n processes like write all possible bits. And now, finally, at the end of the loop, you go down to this last step, check. And this, this line, or this you know, part, is totally deterministic. There's nothing weirdo about this. At this point, you just take the array of you know, true and false, or 0 and 1s, that you've written down. And you know, you'd evaluate the formula, the input formula phi, on this string x. And if x satisfies phi, then you accept. And if it doesn't, you, I mean, this branch rejects. OK, so you'll have two end branches, one for each string. And uh, they'll you know, cause the locally either an accept or reject, according to whether x satisfies the formula or not. You see how this is like perfectly set up for this definition of a non-deterministic machine accepting. <coughs> So uh, let's make some observation, uh, some additional observations. Uh, let's even start with the running time. So I claim that this, this non-deterministic algorithm, this, has poly n running time. Uh, well, it has polynomial in the length of phi running time. So in fact, this loop actually has order n running time, OK? Because every branch takes at most n steps. For each branch, you, know, you just go through a loop of n things where you do a few instructions per branch, uh, per, per uh, line, per iteration of the loop. And then uh, every branch actually ends up doing this thing. And this line takes proportional, time proportional roughly to the length of phi, because you know, checking if a Given string satisfies a formula, you just kind of plug the string into the formula and see what happens. So good, this is a polynomial time algorithm. And finally, you know, I claim it, and I'm going to stop writing this word, but I'll write it this time. It overall accepts um, you know, if and only if phi is satisfiable. Okay, and I think it's easy to see. I mean, uh, in fact, the number of accepting branches out of 2 to the n will be exactly uh, the number of satisfying assignments. So in particular, you overall accept if and only if at least one branch is accepting.
So we can therefore say, actually, I mean, this algorithm, this non-deterministic algorithm, decides that. Sure. So the definition of, you have to define what does it mean running time for a non-deterministic algorithm, but it's like the maximum running time over every branch fork. So I mean, just to put yourself in the place of one process, you know, you do this, it takes maybe a constant amount of time, then, you know, you go through this loop n times, and one particular process will write some arbitrary string, but like this part will take that process itself, maybe order n time, and then each process at the end, you know, checks if the string that's written down satisfies the assignment. And that's also polynomial time. So, I mean, collectively in the aggregate, it takes, I mean, if you count, sum up all the time of all the processors, it would take exponential time. But that's not what we do. Like, we don't sum up all the running time of all the branches. We define the running time to be like the max running time of one branch. For whatever reason. I mean, that's how the definition is. OK. So that's an example of a non-deterministic algorithm. Uh, and actually, let me use some terminology here. Um, once you get. If you, once you get into, or if you get into non-deterministic algorithms, people would usually just describe this with a much more brief sentence. They would say that this algorithm, let me call this algorithm n. I'll also say like n non-deterministically guesses x in 0, 1 star, sorry, 0, 1 n, then checks if it satisfies phi. So I mean, I'm not really defining anything here, but this is a phrase you'll see. Um, and it, it's because actually most non-deterministic algorithms kind of look like this in the sense that you know, in principle, they can just do any old crazy thing they want with like these go-to boasts and forks, but typically they do something like this, where they like maybe use non-determinism in the beginning at a loop to like generate one of many possibilities, and then they do some just deterministic computation afterwards. Okay, and you know, uh, this phrase like non-deterministically guess a string x really just means like do this loop to like create uh, any, on each branch, create a different x. Actually, let me test a little bit your programming skills. Suppose I wanted to uh, guess a string. This guesses a string or forks to get all possible strings of uh, length exactly n. What if I wanted just uh, an x with length between 1 and n? This is just a, like a little puzzle to test your go to both using skills. How would I change this algorithm if, forget this last line, if I wanted to non-deterministically guess a string of length between 1 and n? So I want the branches that I end up finally creating, each one to hold a different string of length at most n, and let's say not 0. I can change this in a fairly minimal way. Well, I'll come to you in one sec, little people can think. Thoughts? All right, I'll take your suggestion. Yeah, exactly. So the idea, which is the correct one, is if you wanted that, you could uh, modify these two lines so they both said go to both 
uh, pop and check. Okay, so I mean, uh, just instead of, it's like instead of continuing the loop, you know, you have a chance to just jump to the end. Okay, so that's an example of like, you know, the funky stuff you can do if you want to uh, do that. <coughs> Another actually possibility is you could have a little loop at the beginning of length, maybe this would give you a string between zero and n or something, a little loop at the beginning that looks similar to this, where it wrote down a log n bit number, call it y, but not deterministically. So like when you fill out all the branches, you'd get all possible log n bit numbers on each branch. So sort of like non-deterministically guessing a number between 1 and n. And then like you could have a subsequent branch where you didn't do this trick, but you just had your loop go from 1 up to y. That would be a different way to accomplish the same thing. OK, well, we're not going to get probably in this class too over enthusiastic about designing non-deterministic algorithms, but a little bit is kind of fun. Uh, let me even just say in words like an uh, alternative viewpoint on, on um, non-deterministic algorithm that's like suggested a little bit by this phrase um, guesses. See, one thing you could do, imagine you had to like um, try to simulate this in real life. I mean, you couldn't. but you imagine you had to do something. <laughs> One thing you could do is just whenever you hit a go to both instruction, flip a coin and like pick one of the two to go to. So then you would just be like a randomized algorithm, which actually is considered realistic. In the end of the course, we'll talk about randomized algorithms. Um, so I don't want to get into it too much here, but that's not too crazy to have a randomized algorithm. Um, so you could try to simulate this with a randomized algorithm where you just every time you did a go to both, you like flipped a coin. It would kind of be similar to picking a random x here. I mean, it would be very similar to picking a random string x here. Um, then though, I mean, you would have to modify or talk about the definition of acceptance. You would say to truly, you know, do what the non-deterministic algorithm is doing, you have to say, I define this randomized algorithm to overall accept if it has a chance of accepting, if it has a positive probability of accepting. Right? Because that's exactly what's going on here. If at least one branch accepts, it's like saying there's like some positive chance that this randomized algorithm would accept, then you accept. And if the randomized simulation has a literally zero chance of accepting, then you would say overall it, it uh, rejects. Okay, so you know, it, it would be if the same definition, it would be like a randomized model of computation with like a bizarre notion of, or you know, an unrealistic notion of overall accept and reject. <clears throat> so you can think about it that way, and maybe we'll talk about this viewpoint much later in the class. Okay, any questions right now? Okay, so uh, there will be some kind of punchline to this uh, related to NP. Uh, so far, we've just defined this weird notion of computation, although you can see it has the you know, property that, for example, if you give yourself this power, you can decide SAT in polynomial time. So let me define for you another complexity class, and it's just called n time. The n is for non-determinism. And it's the same definition as time, f of n, but you're allowed to use a non-deterministic algorithm. So this is all the languages. Um, such that there exists a non-deterministic algorithm um, deciding L in time O of f of n. Let me say n. Okay, and actually, if I really wanted to make this definition formal, I should probably not write algorithm here, but I would write Turing machine. Now, as I said, I didn't actually define what is a non-deterministic Turing machine, but it's basically the same thing. I mean, it's just in every transition, normally a transition, once you finish writing your tape and moving the head left and right, you go to one state. That's what the code says. And now you just let yourself like go to two different states, or actually any number of states. 
So uh, I will have a homework problem about maybe the definition of a non-deterministic Turing machine. But it's, there's nothing uh, unusual about it. Well, except its inherent nature, but I mean, it's, there's nothing non-obvious about it. Um, okay, so I mean, remember what this means. Deciding this is x is in L, if and only if n of x accepts. But you have to remember the meaning of this phrase, n of x accepts. It's like n of x overall accepts. So at least one branch accepts. So I got all the way to the end here and gave up. Okay. Okay, so that's you can define non-deterministic quadratic time or non-deterministic cubic time or non-deterministic n to the tenth time. And of course, what we'll also do is define non-deterministic polynomial time, which is NP. So it's just uh, the union of any time that's polynomial here. Okay, so any language which can be decided by a non-deterministic algorithm in some polynomial amount of time, well, any such language, those languages are called the NP languages. Now, of course, you should immediately get nervous since we defined NP last class, and now we've given a totally different definition in this class. But, of course, the punchline, is, the point is that they're the same. Okay, so I'll prove that now. Remember, we decided before, you might call this like, non-deterministic NP, and the, uh, the notion we saw last time, let's say verifier NP. Just because so far we don't know they're the same thing. They are the same thing. So now I'll show you that like verifier NP is exactly the same set of languages as non-deterministic NP. Okay, any question? <clears throat> so that's what the, I mean part of the reason I even like to find this all this non-determinism stuff is I was like, well, should I guess know what NP theoretically stands for? Non-deterministic polynomial time. Okay, so let's prove this. It's actually, I mean, it's an, inter it's an interesting proof. It's not too hard, but it takes a little thought. Um, so the theorem is that this, you know, non-determinism-based definition of NP is literally the same set of language as our verifier-defined NP. Okay, so we're proving two sets are equal, so of course the proof will come in two parts. We'll show that everything, which direction do I want to do first? Uh, everything that's in NP because of the verifier definition is also in NP with the non-deterministic definition, and then I'll do the reverse. Okay, so let me just do the verifier version implies the non-deterministic version. Okay, so we have to just take a language in here and show it's in here. So say L is a language and it has a verifier V and uh, running in time uh, polynomial in X. Let me write it faintly for a second on inputs, you know, verifiers take two inputs, so x, y. And we want to show it has a non-deterministic algorithm that also decides n, so we're gonna, the only way to do that is to define a non-deterministic Turing machine That also decides L. And um, let me just revise this uh, sentence a little bit. You know, it has, it runs in some polynomial time in X. So let me just, you know, write down a letter for what that is. So we can say it runs in time, let's you know, say K times X to the K. Okay, so if it runs in polynomial time, there is some constant K such that it takes at most this many steps on any input X. Okay, so now we have to define a non-deterministic Turing machine that accepts x according to the weird notion if and only if, uh, uh, well, the verifier in some sense has a chance of accepting x. So let's 
So any uh, suggestions on how to do it? Let me bring this back up. Yes? Uh, that was uh, great, except I wish you said a letter other than X. <laughs> I'm writing X for the like real input. Uh, uh, okay. Why? Yeah, <laughs> right. Good, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, somehow N is supposed to s sort of simulate V. Remember, both of these V and N have like a kind of weirdo condition. Like V is sort of happy if there exists a Y uh, that makes it accept with x and y, and n also has this property that like it, it's happy if there exists a branch on which it uh, accepts. So, um, you know, I won't write this exactly, but uh, <coughs> so this is what it does. Guess, uh, using the exact idea I showed you in the SAT algorithm of having like a loop with a, like a non-deterministic go-to both that like writes down both possibilities. Um, uh, guess uh, y of length less than or equal to k x to the k. Okay, so, um, you know, we're just showing this n exists, so like whatever k is, there is an n that has this k built into it. And uh, here it has to do this slightly funny trick of picking a string having its branches generate all strings of at most this length. So maybe you also have to include the empty string, which I didn't in the little trick above, but you can include that as well. So by doing a loop very similar to before with the non-determinism, it tries out all y's or all the branches, write down all different y's of length at most this. And then it does a deterministic uh, computation. So like it just does v, x, y deterministically each branch, that is, you know, accepts if and only if it accepts. Okay, so that's the definition of the non-deterministic algorithm N. And now I have several things to check. First of all, is N polynomial time? according to the definition, and I won't write any words, but I'll just say uh, yes, because, you know, this first step of guessing y, the amount of time it takes is, well, maybe first you have to compute the length of x, and then you do a loop with, you know, k times x to the k many, length of x to the k many uh, iterations at most, so that's x to the k time roughly. And then this part is also polynomial time because v runs in polynomial time in the length of just x, which is n's input. So n runs in polynomial time, you know, n on input x takes at most poly x time on all branches. In fact, I guess we know v itself takes at most like order x to the k time, so overall running time is order length of x to the k. Yep? When you say guess, why is it important to interpret that you're just basically simultaneously forking every single possible certificate and then just running verifier? That's the idea. When I say guess, let's assume that I, let's ignore, let's say, Let's ignore the empty string here. So I'm guessing a string less of length at most this. When I say guess y, I mean literally do this, except that this x should be y, this n should be k n to the k, and like you should do this comment. Right? I mean, we discussed how this particular loop uses non-determinism to get to a situation where it has exactly two to the n branches, one for each string. Now I basically want to do a similar loop that has like, um, Something like uh, two to the n to the k branches, uh, which each one holds like a string of length at most this length.
funny concept. So yeah. Any any other questions? Yeah. Wait, so can you explain how that's polysynonic? So if you make every thing non determinate, how is that different then? Yeah, so again, yeah, this question came up. I mean, again, you have to remember this part of the definition. I mean, we just define like a non-deterministic Turing machine or a non-deterministic algorithm is like it does not correspond to anything in the real world. So you just have to accept that like we're talking about something that doesn't exist. It's like a mathematical fantasy, and therefore like we can make up any definition we want about it. So we decide to like make up this definition about what is the running time of a non-deterministic machine. And we just say that the definition is that it's the max time on any branch. If we wanted it to like correspond to reality, we could maybe say it's the sum of the running times for all the branches. And then that would have a positive effect, which is that you know, if you had a non-deterministic machine that ran in time t, according to that definition, you could actually make a real algorithm in the real world that ran in time t and did the same thing. But we don't. We instead invent this like, fantasy notion of uh, computation with this like, notion of running time, where we just say, by definition, the running time of a non-deterministic algorithm it's just the maximum time taken by any branch. So each branch here doesn't, each process here itself does not do too much work. Basically, it, it itself you know, goes through a loop of this length that like, writes down a string, and then it simulates v, which itself is poly time. So yeah, in total, they do exponential work, but like, that's not the definition. So here, like this question is with respect to this definition. Good. Um, so the other thing I have to check is that n, you know, accepts L, or n decides L. Okay, so I need to check that x is in L, if and only if, well, n of x accepts. And this statement, this you know, phrase too, is also with respect to this you know, crazy fantasy definition that we invented. We say that a non-determinist algorithm accepts if and only if at least one branch accepts. That's just the definition. So we need to show this by definition is uh, at least one branch accepts. And now we just look back at the definition of n, like what's it doing? What does it mean for at least one branch to accept? It means, just by looking at the algorithm, if and only if, this is not going to connect up correctly, uh, if and only if uh, there exists a y of length less than or equal to k, length of x to the k, such that v x y accepts. And actually, this is practically true by this equivalent to this. It's basically true by definition of uh, v verifies l. In fact, it is true, although it's not 100% obvious. Remember, what is the definition of v verifies l? It's practically this. I mean, it's v verifies l if for every x there exists a y such that v of x, y accepts. So according to our definition, that's, if I just did not write this part, this would be exactly according to the definition from last time. x accepts l if and only if there exists a y such that v of x, y accepts. However, since I know v runs in time at most, basically, length of x to the k, that's this statement that I have on the board with my hand over some part is equivalent to this statement. Because uh, since v only takes this much time, like if it's going to accept anything, it'll accept a string of at most this length. And this is a point that like, exactly comes up on your homework. I mean, I said this point in words like a couple of times now. I never 100% like, wrote it down, but you should 100% write it down in the context of number two on the homework. Um, 
So it was crazy here, but I mean this, this completes this part of the proof. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we're still not done. <laughs> we have to do the other part. Uh, <clears throat> actually, the other part is a little bit trickier, but not too much trickier. Okay, so we have to show kind of that if you have like a non-deterministic algorithm that decides a language, we have a verifier. I should have added the word polynomial time to both of those phrases. Okay, remember what we're doing here. We're trying to show this theorem that this non-determinism-based definition of NP is the same as the verifier-based definition of NP that we talked about last time and which is arguably preferable. Um, okay, we showed half of it that any, if you have a language with a polytime verifier, then you can also build a non-deterministic polynomial time algorithm that decides the language, and now we have to show the reverse. Okay, so, uh, you know, we can, the format of the proof is going to be clear. Say, n is a non-deterministic algorithm, polynomial time. deciding L. And remember, although this is a short sentence, like all of the words here have like a complicated meaning. So polynomial time is with respect to this definition of time, and accepting is with respect to this definition of accepting. OK, and now we need to design a verifier, a polynomial time verifier that verifies the language L. So does anybody have an idea for that? You know, we have this like, uh, you know, pseudocode, let's say n, with all these go-to both instructions in it. And now we kind of like need to imagine, like, how could you certify that n computing on a string x accepts? Remember, the meaning of n accepts is at least one branch causes it to locally accept. I mean, if I like, took a look at this code, and I told you, like, hey, uh, I'm telling you, like, eh, this code will actually accept this particular phi. Like, how, what would be like, a convincing thing to help me? Yep. Uh, and do what? That is the verifier, I guess. Well, what does it check? If X, if there's a satisfying sign. Well, that would work for this particular code. But, like, what, if I just know, like, I have some piece of code and with, like, you know, it's polynomial time, has a bunch of go-to boths in it, uh, yeah? You just tell it the sequences of go-to's that it uses. That's right. You tell it, I mean, the, the, the certificate in general should be like a list of like, for each go to both, like which one to do. That will eventually get you to a local accept. Okay, so let me try to write that. Okay, so again, we need to like write down a letter for the running time of n. So say, n runs in time, n of x runs in time uh, k x to the k. You know, at most this. Um, so the key point is if this algorithm, each branch locally does at most, let's say, k, x to the k time, in particular, it does at most this many go to both instructions. On x does less than or equal to k times length of x to the k go to both.
Okay, so now I have to design, I mean, I'm ultimately trying to show it's in, L is an NP according to the verifier definition, so I have to design a verifier, so here we go. Uh, define V of X, Y like this. Step zero is uh, interpret Y uh, as a string of length um, k x to the k. And really, I mean, I didn't further say it, but like the bits of y are going to be, say, the meaning is like whether the ith bit will be like whether you should do the first or the second go to in a go to both, in the ith go to both instruction. So here's the main part. Simulate. Remember, V is just a normal Turing machine. It's just a normal algorithm. But it's going to simulate N on X. But when it hits its, let's say, I go to both, you know, it's a normal algorithm, so it cannot do the go to both. But it just, it goes, it uses, um, uses y sub i to decide which branch to follow, I mean, which go to to follow. OK, so that's the idea. You see what I mean by this? Like, I mean, if y i is 0, do the first go one. y i is 1, do the second one. that I'm actually like performing some ridiculous computation on the input to the like non-deterministic algorithm. Like, I don't know, let's say I'm computing like prime factors of a number and then verifying that the prime factors fit a certain pattern, right? How does that, like how does this code effectively allow you to do that? Um, well, I mean, what part of this Definition of V, do you think is questionable? It seems like you could build a non deterministic algorithm that, uh, like, essentially doesn't necessarily follow this, like, direct correspondence between the binary bits and, like, each go to call, right? Like, I could just, I could just, I don't know, use go to both to actually create all the input, or, or like, create a range of input irrespective of the value that I inputted earlier, and then just run a single, like, if statement in the internal of that. So that there's not like a direct correspondence between the input and the go to calls that I'm making, so you could use this method. Well, okay, so first of all, I wouldn't say there's a direct correspondence between the input and this. This is our one example of like a non deterministic algorithm. I would say there's a direct correspondence between the input and like the go to both calls it makes here. But it's true that this is, I mean, this is one example of a non deterministic algorithm. It's quite a simple one. It like uses non determinism in a pretty I mean, it could have been worse in like a pretty normal way. Like it does, you know, kind of a pretty controlled version. And it's true that, you know, you could write like a crazy algorithm with like, you know, 50 lines and like go to both are like everywhere. And they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff that doesn't look like this. But like, nevertheless, I'm, I claim that, you know, this is, well, I haven't said much, but I mean, part one of what I'm saying is uh, that V X Y runs in poly x time. And in particular, this is like the normal definition of runs in polynomial time for like a Turing machine. View this just like a normal Turing machine, a normal algorithm. Um, it's doing something a little bit crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's trying to simulate a non-deterministic algorithm. So it's got this like source code. And like, you know, it can start simulating it like normal for a while. And then like it'll go and it'll hit like a go to both instruction. And it'll be like, oh man, now what am I going to do? And well, according to the definition, you, we haven't shown yet why this is a good idea, but this is the idea. When it hits that first go to both, it just looks at the first bit of y. And if it's a zero, it follows, you know, the first path. And if it's a one, it follows the first, the other path. So like if y zero is one, you know, it's, if this were n, it goes along, and it's like, this is fine, this is fine, uh-oh. Hmm, okay, y1 is 1, so I'll just, I won't do go to both, I'll just go to this one. 
So it'll go here and go along, and like, it's like, this is fine, this is fine. Uh-oh, I got another go to both. All right, now just do a look up into my y that was given to me here. What is y2? Oh, y2, let's say, is 0. OK, then I'll just follow this one. So it'll keep going, and like, it'll get to this go to both again, and it'll look in y3 to decide what to do. And you know, it'll look at the first n bits of y, and then it'll eventually get out of this loop, and then it'll just do this stuff. Right, because like if you did, if you if you use the example you did earlier of like having a small for loop that iterates over like the like the length of the input, right? Yeah. Then that would be the beginning of the certificate, and the remainder of the certificate would be the like kind of whether each individual bit is a one or a zero. Versus if you kind of iterate over that input logically, then like so the, the the certificate that you might get from this doesn't correspond to like the certificate you get from like the deterministic solver of the algorithm necessarily, like the logical one. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, one thing I would say is there is no deterministic logical solver of the algorithm. I mean, if I have a non-deterministic piece of a code with like non-determinism, it doesn't like automatically correspond in some way to a deterministic algorithm. I mean, it just is what it is. It's like some source code with some go-to boats in it. And um, you know, even in this case, when we do this v for this particular algorithm, it'll do something that's like a little bit weird, which is that Maybe the running time of this algorithm is, um, you know, it's, it's proportional at least to this length. So actually, the y will be actually much longer than uh, n. So like, there'll be a lot of bits at the end of the y that like, don't even get used by this algorithm because like, the simulation will like, finish before it's used up all like, its choices here. I mean, you can actually, if you prefer to think about it like this way, you can imagine this is kind of like, a randomized algorithm that's trying to simulate n, and like it's using y as its like bank of coin flips. You don't have to think about it that way if you want, but that you could. So I mean, I haven't finished uh, this, but let me finish this, and then we'll come back to the question. So uh, this is good. I'm trying to claim that v verifies l. I'm supposed to at least check that v is polynomial time. That's checked. Um, now, like the main part is uh, this. Mm, let me put it here. Uh, yeah. I have to check a kind of complicated uh, condition. So claim two is that V verifies L. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, I need to show, this is the definition, that X is in L if and only if and the last thing, I mean, the thing that I want to show, this is the definition, is that there exists a y such that v running on x, y accepts. OK, if I can finish this chain, then I have shown that v verifies L. Well, there's only one thing I have to go on here, which is that n decides L in this weird non-deterministic notion of decides. So this is going to be since n decides L, well, what does it mean? Is it still up here? Uh, hopefully here. Aha, yes. X is in L uh, if and only if n like overall accepts. OK. And what is the definition of this? I don't know if I'm going to have space. Well, let's give it a try, see what happens. Uh, there exists 
like a branch or process, process of n of x's computation, which like locally accepts. Right, that's just our crazy definition of what it means for a non-deterministic machine to accept. But like when it does all its processes, like at least one of them accepts. And now I claim that this, this if and only if is true. So why is that? Well, I mean, if you just look at the code of uh, v, you can see at the end it accepts uh, on a given y, if and only if the branch defined by y causes the non-deterministic machine to accept. And we have to like actually check that like. Actually, I should have checked this earlier. Like, v like, never gets stuck in the sense that like, it runs out of bits of y because of this part. I mean, the n only does this many go-to-boths, so like, it'll never encounter more go-to-boths than it like, has you know, pre-chosen uh, choices for. Some people look like, a little bit stunned. Like, this is the end of the proof. Um, yeah. OK, so maybe now I can return to your question or take another question. Yep. So for a lot of the end, well, actually all of the end problems in a deterministic model, the issue was exponential time is very, very bad. But how feasible is it to have a lot of space? If we can have a lot of space, right? A lot of like, space? And, and Uh, okay, I'll come. I'll, I'll answer that question. Although I just, I mean, it doesn't, as far as I can tell, have anything to do with this. But oh, I thought it was because we just showed that all the NP hard problems in the deterministic world can be solved in polynomial time as long as you have exponential space. Uh, okay, so I mean, uh, what we've shown, we didn't define NP hard yet. Uh, we did define NP according to a verifier definition. And what we just showed is that any language that's in NP, like, you know, we saw before that like three coloring is in NP, and um, composites is in NP, squares is in NP, uh, I don't know, Hamiltonian path is in NP. All these things can be decided in polynomial time by a non-deterministic algorithm, which is a weird definition that we invented this morning. Um, and as I said, like this definition, like although it uses familiar words like polynomial time and stuff, it does not correspond to any like reality. It's just some definitions we made. Um, you actually can analyze the space usage of a, a non-deterministic algorithm. We haven't talked about space usage yet, but I can say a few words. Um, but again, the definition, like don't think it corresponds to like something that's happening in reality. It's just again like a mathematical definition. <laughs> And again, you say like the definition of a non-deterministic algorithm using such and such amount of space or memory is just uh, the maximum memory usage over every process. So this algorithm, you would say this non-deterministic algorithm uses like basically order n space, order n memory, because each branch only you know uses this uh, this array x. So again, if you decided this would be a bad idea, but like if you decided to like nevertheless try to like simulate this in actual reality with a normal algorithm, you could do it. It's not like it's impossible, but like it would require um, exponential time to like simulate all the processes. Actually, you could simulate it with polynomial space, because basically you just have to, when you simulate a process, it'll, that process itself will use maybe order n space. 
And maybe at some point you have to like write down like which process I'm simulating. But like you can reuse the space when you're simulating the processes. Well, that's kind of an advanced. Uh, I mean, we'll get to these kinds of notions later. Um, but yeah, you can think about. I mean, so uh, maybe I should add like uh, anything decidable in this weird notion by a non-deterministic Turing machine is decidable by a normal machine. You can simulate this with a normal algorithm. It'll just be like exponentially slower. And in fact, as we showed, like anything that's well, accepted in polynomial time by this machine is in NP. I mean, it equals NP. And on your homework, you'll show that all those languages are in exponential time. So in fact, anything that you can decide with a you know, non-deterministic algorithm in such and such amount of time, you can decide by a normal algorithm in exponential in that amount of time. Any other question? question more like a comment uh, that instead of like using the sequence of codes I guess which may be confusing you can also write think of why the computation trace of and I don't know if we haven't defined that yet but we can define that similar to if we did for Turing machines yeah uh, yeah um, yeah so actually uh, you know at the beginning of this lecture I was like okay I'm gonna do some non-determinism and then I'm gonna start reductions but I think I'm actually not gonna start reductions I'll just only talk about non-determinism, so like you know, we have 20 minutes left to like discuss this. I can say a few more things, but I mean, yeah, it's it's a tricky concept. So I mean, I'm happy to take like lots more questions. Yeah. So like on the homework or in any situation, like we can use either definition of NP basically interchangeably. Yeah. So now that I've given you two different definitions of NP, uh, yeah, you can use either one uh, on the homework. Uh, any other questions? Well, let me spend some time saying some more things that I wasn't necessarily going to say about NP. Um, for example, um, you could use, let's say, this uh, um, this notion of NP to prove that, let's say, three coloring is in NP. Well, we know three coloring is an NP because we have a, a, a polynomial time verifier for it. But let me write a non-deterministic polynomial time algorithm for it. And it'll look heavily like this one. So I'm going to have to change some letters here. This is on input G with N vertices. Now, I mean, this is maybe, in some sense, uh, this is getting at your, your question. Like, this is maybe not like such an, like, an amazingly new example of a non-deterministic algorithm because it's going to look very similar to this, where like even though you have this like glorious power of go to both, you can go crazy and make like a crazy algorithm. I'm still going to in this algorithm like use it in like a somewhat boring way, like to just write down a list of n colors non-deterministically. But in some sense, in some sense, this proof kind of shows to you that any non-deterministic algorithm kind of can be made to look like this, where like it just the first thing it does is it does a loop very similar to this to just write down a bunch of bits, and then it does some deterministic processing afterwards. I'll come back to that point, but let me finish this, uh, this algorithm. So you would allocate x, but instead of it storing bits, it's going to store trits. And uh, OK, yeah, it's a little annoying here. I would, I would like to have, let me, let me write this. This looks a bit illegal, but uh, let me write it for a second. Doesn't really both, and there's three, but anyway. So I'll write red, go to the top, blue, I'll write blue. Okay, and now you have to imagine I did another one here with like write y, and you know, with y. And then the last thing is I'll check that x is a valid coloring of g. Okay, I scribbled on the board, but like, do people get the gist of what I scribbled? I also cheated because I did a go-to both with three 
possible forks. Just so let me do that for a second, and then we'll come back to that issue. So again, this will spawn exactly three to the n branches. Each branch fills x with a different string and like red, blue, yellow. It has polynomial running time because again, like this will take order n time and this check will now take order m time where m is the number of edges in the graph. And it really decides three coloring because you see there'll be at least one accepting branch if and only if there's at least one valid coloring which is the definition of the graph being three colorable. So any questions about that? Like, I mean, maybe except for the fact that this go to both is doing three things. Um, like, do we agree it's a polynomial time non-deterministic algorithm that decides three colorability? It's a loaded question, but it is. Um, okay, so like, let's for fun talk about this. Uh, you know, in my definition of like non-deterministic algorithms, I said like you have go to both. You can go to two. But now here it looks like I've cheated because I got three. But I claim that it's okay if you have some code, non-deterministic code that has a go to both with like three labels. There's an equivalent one that has only like truly good go to both with just two labels. So how can I prove that? Yeah, it's like a programming problem, yeah? Could you just like go to both right y and then like the second thing is the label for the second go to both? Yeah, that's right. So I mean, if I really want to like maybe, you know, not quote unquote cheat and have my go to both only do one of two things, I could simulate it. <laughs> right, like so suppose I want to simulate Go to both, oh, I'm writing in caps, you know, A, B, and C. Well, here's what I do. I do go to both, you know, A and um, D. And then, like, A is just whatever it was before. But, like, D is like a little new piece of code I write off on the side. which just has another go-to both, B, C. And B and C are as normal. So actually, there's a few things to check here. I mean, one thing I should check is that this is a correct simulation in the sense that the code with this instruction accepts the exact same strings as the code with this instruction. I think it's pretty clear, but I mean, if I wanted to check it, like, I'd have to say, okay, if this thing overall accepts, if and only if there's like one branch with these things, and I have to say the same thing over here. Basically, the point is, though, that these guys essentially create the same branches. So here, if we have like a process, and it forks to A, B, or C, and, you know, these guys themselves might generate some new branches. Well, this is essentially the same thing. We have a fork from A to D, and this does the same thing that this does, and this forks to B and C, and this does the same thing that this does. So in both cases, I get the same set of uh, branches. It's just organized a bit differently here. I mean, another thing to check is that this code is technically a little bit slower than this code. Maybe it depends how you count, but like, um, but it's not too much slower, right? For every you know ternary go to both statement here, you simulate it by like a couple of new instructions here. So maybe there's constant factor slowdown in going from here to here. That's okay. It doesn't change the definition of polynomial time. Any questions about that? In fact, let me ask, I mean, I said before, uh, <clears throat> that this, this kind of algorithm looks highly constrained. Like it uses, it has the full like power of go to both, but it does like a pretty simple thing. It just does a loop at the beginning that uses go to both to like write down like a long, let's go back to the SAT case, binary string. 
and then it does some deterministic computation. Whereas in general, you could design a non-deterministic Turing machine that like has go through both like scattered randomly around, does some crazy stuff. But actually, I claim if you have such a crazy you know algorithm, non-deterministic algorithm, you can make an equivalent one that has this more constrained form. Can somebody suggest why? What do you think about it? It's almost like I'm asking you, like, how can you, you know, you know, when I say this crazy form, you know, so here I want like an arbitrary non-deterministic algorithm. You know, that's like some crazy code, and it's got some go-to boats here, and some, you know, they're all over the place. You know, some crazy looking algorithm. And I want to convert it to an equivalent one. It looks like this, um, you know, uh, restraint, non-deterministic algorithm. That looks like it has sort of two pieces. The first is like a loop that uses non-determinism to guess uh, maybe, you know, long, but not too long, let's say polynomial length string. Well, anyway. OK, a string. And by this box, I mean like literally exactly like this, except that maybe, you know, it might not be n. It might be some other length. And then the second part is just normal deterministic code. Yeah? Yeah. That's exactly right. So, like, let's suppose hypothetically that you knew that this code ran in, I don't know, exactly n squared time. Well, you'll do this loop. You'll guess a string of length n squared. And the idea is that this will be exactly like this verifier. This normal deterministic code will like attempt to simulate this code. Now it gets in trouble because this is like arbitrary code with like some go-to bows, whereas this is just some regular old code. So the simulation will go fine for a while, but at some point it'll like hit a go-to both, and it's like, now what do I do? Well, what it'll do is exactly like here. Like when it gets to when it's in trouble for the ith time, it'll like look into this string it guessed the ith position, and it'll just use whether that's 0 or 1 to decide what decision to do, which go-to branch to follow. And so, in effect, this will like simulate this exactly in the sense that it'll generate all the same non-deterministic branches, just sort of in a different way than this one does. Right? So I mean, because you sort of, it's like you're pre-guessing like all the go-to both choices you're going to have to make. And, you know, since it makes some, at most, n squared go to boats, you, know, you can just like pre-guess which one, you know, what you're going to do for all of them, and then deterministically simulate that guess. Make sense? I mean, in some sense, I don't want to go crazy with, like, analyzing non-deterministic algorithms, because it's not even a realistic version of algorithms, so why bother? But um, it's convenient for talking about NP, basically. I mean, now you have two sort of somewhat different ways to like show that a problem is in NP. Either the verifier way, or like, here's a non-deterministic algorithm. I mean, it's ultimately the same, but it, it can be more convenient one way or the other. Um, This picture actually is a good way to look at it. I mean, it'll probably come up in like uh, this homework problem I'll give you about 
defining uh, a non-deterministic Turing machine, but you know, in a normal Turing machine, like it has some configurations, if you recall. It has like some starting configuration. Remember, these are like the con the configuration is like the combination of the tape contents and the head position. So the starting configuration is like says where the head is at the beginning and the tape configuration. And then we said like the definition of computing is you just do the next configuration and then you do the next configuration and you do the next configuration and you do the next configuration and then it eventually halts. I mean, if you remember this from like many lectures ago. And um, it's a little bit pointless to draw this picture when it's a deterministic Turing machine because it just looks like this. There is one like a little bit nice thing about each of these dots represents a configuration. This thing, which is that the length of this path is the running time. It's the number of steps. Now, deterministic Turing machine has the property that like there's not a unique next configuration. It's exactly like at every step you could do a go to both, or you can go to two different Turing machine states and therefore two different configurations. So the picture is you have like the start configuration here. And you know, maybe it goes to two different configurations potentially because of a go to both. Maybe like, you know, on some state you just deterministically go to the next state without doing anything. So you might have situations like this. These are really like the, the, the forks or the branches that the non-deterministic Turing machine or you know, the non-deterministic algorithm does. They don't all have to be the same length, but eventually they should halt. And you get like either accept or reject on each branch. And again, we say the overall configuration accepts if it, at least one branch ends in accept. If they all end in reject, we say the overall computation rejects. And the running time is the depth, the maximum number of steps taken on any computation path. Let me end with one definition. Um, you know, I said one, why do we study this non-determinism? Well, it wasn't really essential, but we did it. And then it helps you reason about NP. But actually, another a def reason for studying it is you can actually invent some even more complexity classes than just NP using non-determinism. For example, you know, I define this complexity class n time f of n. It's all the problems decidable by a Turing machine running in order f of n time. So just like I defined earlier exp, you can define n exp in the same way. So this is another, yet another complexity class. n exp is the set of all languages such that there exists a non-deterministic algorithm and uh, running in time two to the length of x to the k for some k deciding L. Okay, so it's the exact same definition as x, except now you let it be a non-deterministic algorithm. So this is now some crazy new class of languages that is even bigger than exp. And you might say, well, like, wow, this is really like insane. Like you took like a class that was already kind of unrealistic for life purposes exp, and you made it even more crazy by allowing non-determinism. It's true. Like there are some languages in this class. All these languages are decidable by some algorithm, but maybe in doubly exponential time or something. But there's still, it turns out, there's still some interest in complexity theory in studying these languages. Um, for example, I think I mentioned this before, but like, uh, one interesting thing about this, this, it can be shown, this contains some languages provably not in NP. 
remember we actually kind of worked hard to find some decidable languages in exp that are not in polynomial time, you can do something that's even a bit more tricky to find some language in here that's, not, that's definitely not in NP. That's a little bit interesting. This is also like, um, contains like a lot of problems related to games. For example, I mentioned this before, but like uh, if I give you uh, a generalized chess problem, I give you like a board that's not 8 by 8, but it can be any size, and it's got like some chess pieces on it, and I say, is there a, can white win from this position, yes or no? Uh, this can be solved in NEXP, and it's like the smallest class we know where you can solve that problem. So if you're into that, then that's like another reason to think about next. Okay, so uh, next time we'll actually start on reductions.